Welcome back everybody to The Law of Tort. In this video we are continuing talking about the issue of causation and we are focusing on this idea of intervening causes or new intervening causes as ways to represent a sort of break in the chain of causation um, from one event to another. So this is going to start to depart away from some of the more ordinary issues which involve uh, basic causation claims and we're going to start to talk about situations where there may be new intervening acts which contribute to material harm being caused to a claimant. Now, just remember what causation is actually trying to show. It is trying to show that the thing that was negligent, okay, in case of in, in negligence cases, let's just use that as an example. There are obviously other torts that exist. But in, in negligent cases, the thing that was negligent, the breach of a duty of care, causally led to the damage that was created, that was en that ended up in the uh, at the feet of the claimant. So the reason why the but for test is so important and is is so strict is because it essentially asks us to imagine a world where the negligent event didn't happen. So imagine, imagine we go into an alternate reality where this breach of duty did not happen, where the, where the defendant was not negligent, okay? And then it asks us to, to, to watch and see what happens. If the, def if the claimant, sorry, still suffers some kind of harm, still suffers the same kind of damage, then you can make the conclusion that it wasn't the negligent action that caused that damage. That's what the but for test essentially is telling us to do. Yeah, think of it like that. Think of it like we are the Doctor Strange looking into an alternate reality and trying to find um, and trying to find out what would have happened if the negligence didn't happen. And so novus actus interveniens, new intervening causes, represents an issue in relation to this particular topic. It is used to describe situations where the ordinary chain of causation is not as clear cut, where negligence on the part of the defendant causes the damage on the part of the claimant, where, where there's, there is doubt, there is negligence, and that negligence causes the claimant some kind of harm. What happens when there is an ordinary course of causation which appears to satisfy the but for test? So imagine if there's a situation where, on all accounts, there is a but for causation, but then something else happens between the defendant doing the negligent action and the claimant suffering damage that may contribute to further damage. What happens to the chain of causation at that point? Well, Often, in complex tort cases, the chain of causation isn't often this idea of there being one defendant that does a negligent thing that directly leads to a claimant being being harmed, and it's as simple as that. In a lot of cases, there's all sorts of different intervening causes. There's maybe three or four different things, some of which may be negligent, some of which may not be negligent. And all of these things sort of contribute to the damage that has been caused. We'll examine over the next few lessons about how new intervening causes are brought about, um, first by claimants themselves and then by the third party. So let's think about the case here of McCoo versus Holland and Hannon from 1969. This case illustrates the court's approach to the situation where the claimant had contributed to the damage and thus represented a new intervening cause. So let's imagine this situation. We have a defendant. Uh, who has done a thing which breached their duty of care? Let's just use negligence as an example again. And they have and they have done something that is negligent. Okay, this negligence then causes some kind of damage to a claimant. Okay, but at the same time, or even before that, the claimant also does something which exacerbates this situation, and so does something that contributes to the damage. The facts of this case are as follows. The claimant had sued his employer for negligently failing to provide a handrail, which led him to fall down some stairs. The claimant himself had been injured prior to this from a work-related accident, this former incident causing his leg to be weakened. Okay. The resulting weakened leg was the main cause for him falling down the stairs, since it gave way when he was walking back, and then obviously the lack of handrail meant that he could not help but fall and was injured. Now, what we have here 
is negligence on the part of the defendant for failing to provide a handrail, but you also have a novus actus intervenience. You have a new intervening cause. Of course, the weakening of the leg, which meant that he fell in the first place. And so he fell in the first place, which then led to him being unable to grab the handrail because it negligently did not exist. The claimant issued a claim against his employer for both injuries. And it was the claimant's decision to go down the stairs alone which injured his leg, and so an unreasonable action was considered to be the case in and of itself. So we have two sort of things that we have to think about. The nervous in actus intervenience was partly the weakened leg, okay, but more importantly, it was his decision to go down the stairs unassisted, knowing that his leg was injured and was weakened okay and so this decision to do so was not a decision that was uh, the fault of the defendant and so represented a novus actus intervenes it broke the chain of causation for the negligent action of the injury so you cannot accurately say that it was the defendant that caused the situation that caused the damage that he that he suffered from falling down the stairs because it was the decision on the part of the claimant to uh, to, to 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 go down the stairs unassisted knowing being and reasonably foreseeing that there would probably or could have been um, some danger as a result of doing so because he knew he had a weakened leg a similar example takes place in the case of Reeves versus Commissioner of Police for the, Metropol uh, Metro for the Metropolis in 2000. This was a case which involved an individual who had committed suicide in a police cell under while he was under custody. Now, the claimant sued the police since they were in breach of their duty to try and take care and to prevent suicide from taking place. So there was negligence. And so what we have here is two decisions. We have a negligence on the part of the defendant, and then we have the cause on the part of the uh, uh, the damage to uh, at least a friend of the claimants or, 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 a, or a relative of the claimants um, in the suicide that had taken place. The defense had argued that the decision and the action of the third party to actually decide to commit suicide had broken the chain of causation and therefore the police should not be liable owing to the fact that this was a novus actus intervenience. So they were negligent in breaching their statutory duty to take care and prevent a suicide from taking place but the mere existence of a suicide, the actual decision on the part of the individual to commit suicide, broke the chain of causation. That was according to the defence. However, this was an argument that was rejected by the House of Lords, since the very alleged break in the chain of causation was the damage that the police had a duty to prevent. You can't say that the, du that the police have a duty to prevent suicide and that it was their breach of duty that led to a person committing suicide, and then go on to say that, well, actually, no, the decision to commit suicide was a novus actus intervenience, was a break in the chain of causation. It wasn't us that committed suicide. It was the person, or we didn't kill the person. It was the person who actually committed suicide that made that decision. But it was the, it was the actual commission of suicide that the House of Lords held was the duty of the police. So there wasn't a new intervening cause in this case even though the defence argued that there were. Finally then, let's think about cases where the claimant acts in a way which causes further injury beyond the negligence of the defendant, and this is related to the concept of unreasonableness. Okay. So, for example, there was the performance on the part of the claimant unreasonable as to break the chain of causation and represent a new intervening cause. Um, in 1968, the case of Wyland and Cyril Law Carpets argues that, um, suggests that this is not the case, because the claimants had become injured as the result of negligence on the part of the defendant. The injury meant that she had to wear a neck brace, which restricted her use of um, uh, her glasses, causing her to miss a step and fall down some stairs. It was held that her actions in this case had not been unreasonable. And so the defendant was still liable for the subsequent injury. So where there are circumstances in which the claimant had acted in a way which was unreasonable, which is not something that they would consider to be reasonable given the condition that they were in, 
then this is a circumstance where um, there may be a break in the chain of causation. But as a result of this, the negligence on the part of the defendant, okay, was the cause of the damage on the claimant's part, okay? It was not unreasonable for her to try and walk down some stairs in a neck brace. What was, and so the result was something that was not unreasonable. And so, therefore, the defendant was liable also for the subsequent injury, as well as the injury which caused her to be in a neck brace in the first place. So in the previous lesson, we spoke about this idea of new intervening causes, novus actus intervenience. And we remember from the previous lesson that what we're essentially trying to show is that we can show a chain that exists from the defendant to a claimant, such that it was the action of the defendant in being negligent or whatever tort we're talking about. Okay, we're using negligence as, a, as, a, as the example here. Um, causation is also important in other areas of tort and also in other areas of law. Um, but we are showing that the negligence on the part of the defendant was the cause of the damage that was suffered to the claimant. The idea of a novus actus interveniens is that along that chain of causation, was there something else that had happened that contributed to the damage, such that the chain of causation breaks and you cannot adequately say that the defendant was the true cause of the damage and therefore not satisfy the book four test. The previous video spoke about novus actus interveniens as a result of actions caused by the claimant. So what if there is a causation, we have a chain from the defendant to the claimant, but the claimant does something which exacerbates the situation and so represents a new intervening cause. This lesson is going to think about this same question, but not where the claimant does something to exacerbate the situation, but where a third party comes in and does something which may represent a new intervening cause. Now, it should be noted that this new intervening cause needn't be negligent or non-negligent, okay? It could be a negligent cause, but it could also be something that was non-negligent, the result of non-negligence. So, like I said, we talked about nervous actus intervenience. This lesson, we're going to talk about intervening causes, which were the results of actions by third parties. The most common situation, in fact, where a third party can represent a new intervening cause is in relation to an idea where the third party is trying to make some kind of rescue or help the claimant who had been injured as the result of actions of negligence uh, the, uh, of, a, of a defendant. So a defendant does some negligence, okay? They do some, they have a duty and they breach it over here. And then they, uh, then, then there's damage to the claimant. And then in trying to help the claimant, a third party actually causes more problems than, it, than they solve. Um, while the courts are often very favorable to those who try and help, for whatever reason, and if they fail to do so, if they are unable to help for, uh, for whatever reason, there are some circumstances in which a third party has acted so poorly that their intervention in trying to help has represented a new cause of the damage. So rather than trying to help, they make the situation worse. And again, this is not always the result of negligence and it's not always the result of, uh, of anything and, sent, and as a result of which, Third parties aren't often um, found liable in tort for their um, failure to help or for them trying to help and doing so poorly a job of it um, that they cause more problems in the, in the first place. An example of this is the case of uh, Oro Pisa from uh, the Oro Pisa from 1943, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, this was a ship which had collided with another ship. The master of the original ship had made an attempt to cross over to the Oropisa to try and help with salvage. However, the ship had sunk and nine people drowned in the process. Quite a horrific thing that took place. The courts held that the chain of causation had not been broken by the actions of the claimant and that the damaging situation was caused by the collision. So the master of the other ship had actually acted reasonably in response to the emergency situation. And such as, uh, as such, the deaths, the damage was a result of the collision, not the attempted rescue. So this represented a new intervening cause that was, um, or, or at least an alleged new intervening cause that actually turned out to not be one in the first place. A better example is the case of 1982 of Knightley versus Johns. This was a case which involved a car accident which had taken place in a tunnel. Again, the car accident was the result of negligent action on the part of the defendant. 
When the police arrived at the scene, one police officer ordered a police motorcyclist to ride against the traffic, resulting in a second injuring, um, a second accident injuring the claimant. Okay, so this was a, a seemingly a, a, a very silly decision on the part of the police officer um, to order a, a motorcyclist to ride against the traffic, which caused another injury. The question for the courts was whether or not the defendant who was responsible for the first accident was responsible for the cause of this second accident, okay? Or whether or not the police officer represented a new intervening cause. So let's think about this. Let's think about this as a chain of causation. You have a defendant, okay, who then does some damage as a result of their negligence to a claimant, okay? And then... Or, or to another, this is to actually they do damage to a third party. The 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 uh, car accident that had taken place in a tunnel was actually not to do with this actual case. That the, the claimants were actually the people who had been damaged and hurt by the police officers. So, defendant through negligence causes damage to a, a third party. The decision on the part of the police when they arrive to get the motorcyclist to ride against the traffic then causes a second accident, which was against the claimant. So we sort of have like three points and two arrows that go from the defendant to a third party to the claimant. The claim here was whether or not the defendant was liable for this second accident or whether or not the, the order on the part of the officer, the police officer, um, to get the other police officer to ride in the other direction, whether or not that represented a new intervening cause and therefore broke the chain of causation. It was held on the part of the latter, essentially that the action of the police officer had indeed broken the chain of causation. Not only was it a positive act rather than a failure to act, unlike the previous case, but it was also something which was not reasonably foreseeable as a result of the negligence of the defendant in the first accident. So the defendant did an did a negligence, okay, and they and they had an accident, okay. But that that defendant could not have reasonably foreseen that the police officer was going to be ordered to ride a motorcycle against the traffic, and that that would cause another accident. That's not reasonably foreseeable at the point at which the first accident had taken place. So you cannot argue that it was the actions of this um, negligent case and this negligence that at the beginning that led to this damage at the end. Welcome back everybody to the Law of Tort, specifically talking about the concept of causation. This lesson is going to focus on the idea of remoteness. We're going to illustrate the idea of what remoteness essentially means when we, when we look at a couple of cases in this, in this lesson. And really we're just rounding off our conversation about causation. Causation has essentially been uh, the remit of a number of different lessons over a number of uh, a number of different weeks, and so we're going to finish off this lesson by talking about remoteness, talking about causation in in its final um, aspects, and then we're going to start talking about other torts that are of relevant to uh, relevance, shall I say, to to law students um, in and around the United Kingdom. So we'll talk about employer's liability, vicarious liability, occupier's liability, nuisance, uh, as well as defamation. So this is the final lesson, as I've mentioned, talking about the concept of causation, taking some time looking at the idea of remoteness of harm. Now, assuming that we can show both on the part of the claimant that there is negligence in the sense that uh, we can show that there was both a duty of care on the part of the um, of the defendant and that there was a breach of that duty uh, by going below the standard of care and suppose that we could also show that there was causation in fact i.e we can show that we can satisfy the standard but for test for causation uh, i.e but for the actions of the defendant the claimant wouldn't suffer uh, or have suffered the harm that was incurred the final hurdle required is for us to understand causation in law to understand the idea of remoteness so this is because even if there is causation in fact, it might still be the case that the damage was so remote as to be very far removed from the original negligence itself, such that even if we can conclude, successfully conclude, that there was negligence, that there was a breach of a duty of care, and that this led to, through the satisfaction of the but-for test, the, the, the harm that was caused, 
if it was so far removed from the original negligence, if that harm and that damage was so far removed from the original negligence, then the defendant may be able to escape liability by failing to satisfy the idea of remoteness. Now, there are two cases that can illustrate this quite nicely. The first is the number one wagon mount case from 1961. We talked in previous lessons about the second wagon mount case. Um, this lesson is going to focus on the first one. Um, so we've saw we saw about we've seen the second wagon mount case, like I said in previous lessons, when discussing other elements of the breach of a duty of care specifically. Um, this one concerns itself with the issue of remoteness. Now the defenders in this defendants, should I say, in this case were the charterers of the wagon mound. The wagon mound was a ship which had oil in it, which had leaked. The employees had let the spillage spread across uh, the water. The rationale for letting this spillage spread was the fact that the only real damage that could have been done um, uh, would be if it was to have caught fire. And this would have been very unlikely given the circumstances, given the fact that it was on the water and given the fact that there was very little indication that it could set fire. And so as a result of which, rather than trying to spend a lot of time and energy trying to clean up the oil spell that had been essentially imposed, they decided to just leave it and um, assume that there would be no damage that would be caused. When the oil spillage did subsequently catch fire and therefore cause damage to the claimant's dock, that claimant sued for negligence. It was held that, despite the fact that we can clearly show causation in fact, we can clearly show that the damage was the result of the oil spill, which was the result of the negligence of the uh, of the charters of the wagon mound, because but for the oil that had caught fire, there would not have been damage to the dock. So we can show causation in fact, but the courts held that the damage was too remote for there to be a valid claim in law. It was not reasonably foreseeable that the oil would catch fire on the water. And so as a result of this, we would suggest that there was a lack of remoteness. And so as a result, even though we can show that there was a duty of care, we can show that there was a breach of the duty of care, we can show through satisfaction of the but for test that there was causation in fact, we cannot show that there was um, a lack of remoteness if it wasn't too remote um, for the uh, imposition of liability to the defendants. Similarly, in 1963, we see another case that illustrates this point quite nicely, the case of Hughes versus the Lord Advocate. This case was concerning a group of workmen who were working around a manhole. Before leaving, they had left the hole open and guarded it with a number of paraffin lamps. Paraffin lamps is a type of oil lamp. So this was the 1960s. There was there was electricity, but they, you know they they still just used paraffin lamps in this time, uh, at, in various different points and various different stages. So a type of oil lamp. Subsequently, uh, in time, a group of children would start to play with the lamps, knowing uh, one into uh, a hole, leave, leave, uh, leaving one, uh, throwing one, should I, <laughs> throwing one into a hole. Um, when they threw it into the hole, this caused an explosion. This explosion injured a number of the children. The argument that was levied on the part of the defendants was that the damage was so remote that they would not be liable. It was not reasonably foreseeable that such an event would have occurred resulting from the leaving of the lamps. So let's just think about this. Let's just think about this using our ordinary conception of the law of negligence. We have a duty of care on the part of the people, the workmen around the manhole. We also have a duty of care in the sense that they um, had a duty to take care to ensure that people wouldn't fall in or at least wouldn't uh, be unable to see the hole that was open. So they put a number of paraffin lamps there and guarded them. Um, the extent to which they breached this duty of care is obviously debatable. But of course, if we assume that they breached the duty of care by falling below the standard, by leaving paraffin lamps rather than doing anything else, maybe by leaving a sign instead, um, that could have also have been uh, a, a useful way of ensuring that those uh, that the hole was guarded. 
We then can think about causation in fact. We can think about the fact that but for the breach of a duty, but for the leaving of the oil lamps around the open hole, the children would not have thrown those into, a, in, into the hole. They would not have fallen into the hole. It wouldn't have caused an explosion. So we can even satisfy the but for test. We could say that, well, actually the children, the group of children, um, would not have been able to, uh, been able to uh, essentially throw the lamp in the hole if there wasn't the lamp in the first place. Now, the argument for the defendants was that it was very unforeseeable that the damage that was caused would have been uh, would have, would have occurred owing to the fact that the damage was so remote it would not be liable it would not be foreseeable this was a view which was rejected by the house of lords because the house of lords argued that uh, the leaving of the lamps in the manner that was done could have reasonably and foreseeably um, caused injury as the result of burns they don't have to show it doesn't have to be shown that the damage caused was the damage very specifically in relation to the children throwing the lamps into the hole or the lamps falling into the hole as a result of children playing with them. What the House of Lords suggested was that the damage incurred was damage uh, as a result of burns, as a, as a result of injuries. Leaving the lamps in the manner done would have caused and could have caused reasonably foreseeably, uh, reasonably and foreseeably caused some kind of damage in the way of burns. They don't have to conclude that it was foreseeable that children would come along and that they would play with the lamps and that the lamps would fall into the hole. But what is foreseeable is that there could have been damage, there could have been injuries as the result of leaving the oil lamps in the way that they did. This is really where the failure of re the remoteness argument actually took place in this case.